in our mini series so far, we've seen that Jesus is the one who saves us from sin. He gives release from the effects of sin, guilt, shame and fear. We've seen that Jesus is the one who cares for us in the here and now. And we learn that we, we hold in tension the fact that Jesus can, God does heal us. And ultimately we get a new body where there's no more need of healing. And at the same time, the need to trust him in the midst of sickness and perhaps growing older sometimes even as well. And last week we saw that Jesus is the king. On Easter Sunday, he reminded ourselves that he's the, the conquering, the commanding, the compassionate and the coming king. He's the one who, who we hope for in the future and who gives us authority for our marching orders in our, in our world today in which we live. This week, we want to look at the last aspect of who Jesus is to us before we start a new series. Classically termed, Jesus is our sanctifier. And that's a very religious word, isn't it? It's a word that means he sets us apart. And we'll, we'll sing about that in, at the close of the service. He sets us apart. He makes us holy. And that's the root of the word. The root of the word is, is to sanctify, is, is the same as the word to set apart or to be made holy in that way. And so Jesus is the one who sets us apart, makes us holy, sanctifies us. It's still complicated to understand. So can I frame it in terms of our core values here at the church? He is the one who transforms us. He makes us like himself. Now, I think that's really good news for us as believers, because so often it, the church has such a negative image in the, in the world. People see Jesus as very positive, but see the church as negative. And yet we're being made into the likeness of Jesus as believers. So that's huge. If we can be more like Jesus, even as the church, as well as individuals, then people will be more attracted to who he is and want to find him for themselves. The passage that Martha read, it starts in chapter 4 and verse 1. And she didn't read the first four verses. I asked her not to very deliberately. It says, therefore, in chapter 4, verse 1. And as soon as we see the word therefore, we need to think in terms of what happened before and the previous couple of verses. And the previous couple of verses at chapter 3, it says this. Now, the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And we are being transformed into his image. And that's the idea behind Jesus is our, our sanctifier. He, he's our transformer, if you like. He makes us like himself. When you become a believer, when you start following Jesus, he's in that process then until you meet him face to face, becoming more and more like him. I know that's true of my own life, that Jesus wants to transform us. He does transform us. He makes us more like himself. Um, there's a reason for this. It says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. Jesus doesn't just save us, he doesn't just forgive us of our sins, doesn't just give us a hope for the future, but in this life he's starting to make us like himself so that we can reflect him, we can be like him, because he wants us to be like him and have many brothers and sisters. That's why it says in those previous verses that we are being transformed into his image. You, you think about this idea of transformation just a little bit, uh, and there's a there's a sense in which both a process, it, uh, we get our English word from the Greek word, uh, which this comes from, it, it's the word metamorphosis. Every child knows that uh, a caterpillar goes through a, a metamorphic process to turn into a beautiful butterfly. And there's several stages to that, from the, the pupae to the cocoon to the eventual popping out of the chrysalis and, and, and flying away to reproduce again. And each stage is actually quite, quite traumatic in a sense. Or, or, or a tiny frog spawn becoming into a, a full-grown bullfrog 
And it goes through these stages as well. And the tadpole grows arms and legs and, and, and then it, it turns into a frog and loses its tail. And, uh, and there's a transformation, a metamorphosis so that what started comes into what it should be as well. And that's that word here, which is used that we are being transformed into the image of Jesus. The big problem which we see in this thing is that you and I sometimes get discouraged. And so that's why Paul, I think, says we do not lose heart in verse one. Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And then he gives three reasons why we could lose heart in verse two. The word lose heart is, is the idea of becoming discouraged. And sometimes in our Christian lives, as we start to learn to follow Jesus and want to be more like him, we can get discouraged. And the first reason, he says, is in the first third of the verse, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. And one of the problems we have in our Christian lives is we don't give up certain things which we know to be wrong. That's a basic step when you become a follower of Jesus. You have this desire to start being like Jesus. And yet at the same time, we sometimes want to hold on to the things which we used to do. And we need to learn to renounce those things, get rid of them. Paul calls them here secret and shameful ways. There's a verse in John chapter 3 which says that men love darkness more than light because it hid their sins. And there's a sense if we can keep some of the stuff undercover, it's secret, it's shameful, it's dark. One of the big problems today is, is that the things which used to be in the dark are now out in the open and they're not secret and shameful anymore. But in God's sight, they are still secret and shameful. And the second thing he says in this in this verse, in verse chapter in chapter four, verse two, is we do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. And so the second thing which sometimes discourages us is we don't take seriously God's word. We don't take either its positives or the negatives seriously. The great promises of Scripture for us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from the book of first John. And at the same time, the, the need to, to give up certain things. Philippians chapter 2 talks about this idea that, we, that God, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who both wills and works in us. And we need to, we need to want to work out what God has given in us. Not work for it, but to, to work out that seed of salvation and, and see it prosper. And a serious new Christian works this stuff out and we need to take seriously the message of God in the whole scriptures. Sometimes we have this little phrase when you when you take an oath in a court of law we we promise to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and actually those three ideas are very important because if we don't tell the whole truth we're deceiving ourselves if we don't read the whole of scripture we're deceiving ourselves. If we mix it with other things, we, we tend to deceive ourselves. And so I think the idea in this verse is that we need to take very seriously the word of God. It's what God's given to us. It's his revelation for our lives. And if we don't, we can become discouraged in this process of starting to become like Jesus. And of course, we know that Jesus was the ultimate in terms of taking seriously God's word. He memorized it. He could quote it. He was tempted and he could quote it back to the devil. He used it all through his teachings. We need to be the same way as well. And then the last part of verse three, verse two says this. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Sometimes when we try to do things for appearance sake, we're not commending ourselves plainly. We need to be honest. Sometimes people, they know we're hypocrites. We, we say one thing and do another. We, we need to be honest and say, I'm at this point in my journey in the Christian life. I'm at this place. I'm working on it. God's working in me. I'm excited to do this. Perhaps you're in that place as well. We, we, we try to do things for appearance sake, to look good. All these things at the end will discourage us 
from starting to continue to being on that journey with Jesus to be like him because he wants us to be that way. So where do we start? The next two verses in verses four, five and six tell us where we start. It says this, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus sake. For God who said, let light shine, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I love the fact that that verse is the motto of the city of Wolverhampton. Let light shine out of darkness. And God has put his light inside us as believers, the light of Jesus by his spirit, so that it shines forth into other people's lives. So where to start? We need to put Jesus at the centre. Paul puts it this way. He says, he says that we make Jesus our Lord and us as your servants. And there's this sense in which we as Christians need to know and understand that we need to put Jesus first at the centre of our lives. And he starts to radiate his light through all our lives as well. There's a wonderful picture which is sometimes used of when a person becomes a Christian. They, they invite Jesus into the, the household, if you will, of their lives. They, they give him the front door key. And Jesus comes in and you welcome him and you say, let's, let's eat something together in the kitchen. And he comes into the kitchen and he, he's part of your life in the kitchen area of your life. And then we say, well, come and sit down in the living room. And, and he sits down in the living room with you. And gradually he starts to influence all the different rooms of your life. But there's sometimes a, a little closet hidden away, a little cupboard underneath the stairs where you, you stick stuff which you don't want anybody to see. And eventually Jesus might say to you, can we just have a clean out in that cupboard, please? And, no, I don't want to. Oh, okay, if you say so, Lord, you're Lord of my life. And you open the cupboard and you clean it out with Jesus. And at some point, you might just say to him, Lord, I've given you the key. You're welcome, my home, but I'm going to sign over the whole lot. You get to be Lord of my life. Do whatever you want. It's a bit of a crisis, to be honest. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Start on that journey of giving him control. The right to speak to your heart in all the different areas of your life. Make him Lord. And when he does that, oh, it's a place of blessing. He, he, he knows what he's doing. He knows what's right for you. He made you. He cares for you. And then you become servant to him and then servant to others in their lives as well. So live life as we say theologically, Christocentrically, make Christ the Lord of your life. There's so many other ways we can make Jesus into our lives. We need to see him as the risen Lamb of God. That's making him at the centre. A lot of people keep him as a baby at Christmas. Oh, it's a nice thing to have a baby Jesus. But, but Jesus wants to be more than that. He wants to be the risen, conquering Lord. Some people keep him as a good person, a good example. He, he was a good son. He was a carpenter. Took care of his mother at the cross. I mean, remember, at the cross, Jesus looked at Mary, his mother, and said, Ah, there's your son. And he pointed to his cousin, John. And there's your mother. And Take care of him. He was a good son. He was a good carpenter. A good example. People want to keep Jesus there. But no, Paul is saying, make him Lord of your life. Let him into the rooms of your home, as it were. And eventually you might just decide, ah, don't just give you the keys, Lord. I give you the title deed to my life as well. The, the, the next thing that Paul says in this passage is in verses 7 through 12. We have this treasure. What's this treasure? This treasure is the light that comes out of our hearts. It's the light of the gospel. It's the lights there because of the Holy Spirit who's given to us. That's where we started out in chapter three. That's how God transforms us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so the next principle, if you will, is this, that we need to understand that the difficulties of life let Jesus' power shine through. And there's two, well, several descriptive words here. He says this treasure that we have, what we have inside of us is the ultimate treasure, the gift of life through the Holy Spirit. 
It's, it's the most marvellous thing that you can have. You can have all the world, all the possessions of the world, all the glory of the world, all the esteem of the world, and not have the gift of life, the Holy Spirit within you. And actually, when you die, you're done. So he calls it a treasure. But then he describes our bodies as a jar of clay. I had when I moved into our house, we had some tiles made of clay just kicking around in the backyard. And I, I sorted through them and half of them were chipped and some were broken. Others had edges gone, but there were some whole ones in the midst of it. And the problem with clay and jars of clay is they do get chipped. They do get cracked. They do get broken as they journey through their lives. Archaeologists go find these and they can date certain buildings and time periods from the clay they dig up. And some of it's by how much into little pieces it's turned into. And that's the problem with jars of clay. They're not permanent. There's some of the words which Peter, sorry, Paul uses in this passage and the surrounding chapters for our human physical frame, our bodies, if you will. He calls them jars of clay. He calls them our body in verse 10. He says our mortal flesh in verse 11. He says our outer man in verse 16. In chapter 5 and verse 1, the next ch chapter, he calls it our earthly tent. And this body we have is, is a jar of clay. It, it's, it's temporary. It's wearing out. As you get older, you'll discover it. <laughs> I'm not the person I was when I was 30. Uh, and when I was 40, I could just about keep up with the 25-year-olds. And um, not anymore. It's gone. I can still do stuff. But the body is slowing down. It's getting blown over. Tent poles are creaking in the language of a tent. The outer man is wearing down. And one day, like a tent, it will get blown completely over. But the treasure that this body holds is still intact. Paul says in verse 16, it's being renewed day by day. In the midst of this life with its difficulties, the body wearing out, we need to let Jesus' power, which is inside of us, shine through. There's a sense in which we should become more full of grace, more full of empathy, more full of thanksgiving as we go through life, because the outer man is wearing down. And so embrace these tensions. Embrace the idea that you're, you're breaking down. There's difficulties, there's tragedies. And embrace the idea that the power of Jesus can shine through in the midst of those. So it's not a question of avoiding the body breaking down, the difficulties of life taking up over you. It's a matter of embracing it, but letting the power of God shine through in the midst of it. And that's what Paul is saying. We also carry verse 10, he says, around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also revealed in our body. And he says in the next couple of verses that this is for the people he's writing to. He says that I've got death in my body, I'm slowly dying, but life is coming through. And that's for the purpose of of you, he says to his audience. And so as Christians, we need to overcome some things. We need also to let Christ be the center and grow in that. We need to understand that as we grow and go older, the life of Jesus can shine through more and more. In verses 13 and 18, he gets very explicit. He says in verse 13, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. He quotes from Psalm 116 and verse 10. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. And so there's this sense that, that change comes by trusting Jesus. You might have something which you, God is speaking to you about, which you know if you stop doing and do something else, you'll start to become more like Jesus in it. And those two concepts are very important. It's not just about stopping doing something. It's about starting doing something else instead. It's very simple in some ways. People who give up smoking have to do something else because smoking happens in times. It's, it's, a, it's a reactive thing. So they do something else instead. 
And, and the same within our Christian lives as well. As we stop doing something the Lord doesn't want us to do, we need to replace it with something else. It is written, I believe, therefore I've spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Which brings us to this second concept in this idea of trusting, is the words we speak are actually very powerful. The world has got this idea, don't they? They've got this idea of positive thinking. If you think positively, good things will happen. There's an element of truth in it, as it says here. I believe, therefore I have spoken. The words you speak will reinforce truth in your life. If we speak lies to ourselves, that's not going to induce change. What I sometimes call our self-talk. The psalmist writes in Psalm 42, he speaks to himself, why are you downcast, O my soul, he says. He's talking to himself. We need to make sure in our lives that our self-talk, the words we tell ourselves are true, God's word truths, and not the lies of the evil one. Oh, I'll never change this habit. Where do we get that from? That's not from God. That's not from God at all. The truth is, you can change. The truth is, by God working through you, by you putting him at the centre of your life, working out your salvation in fear and trembling, by you letting the, 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 the light of Jesus shine out, by you trusting, you can change. Because he's put his light in you, he's put his spirit inside of you. He will sanctify you, make you more like his son. He'll transform you. So speak words of truth, God's truth. Otherwise, when we speak the lies to ourselves, which the evil one is often putting there, you're not important. You'll never amount to anything. You can't change this. When we start to say those things to ourselves, they become truth in our heads and our words. And we don't change. And so Paul says we need to believe. And therefore I've spoken about these things in this passage. In verse 18, he, he concludes this thought. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And friends, it's so important as we think about these things of what we speak the promises of scripture and the lies which the scripture tells us, the evil one will tell us, that we always understand that we're fixing our eyes on what is eternal. In other words, what we can't presently see, because what we can see is only temporary. Everything is always changing. Nothing's permanent. Your car breaks down. Life changes. Your body breaks down. If you own a home, you've always got to fix something and it's always changing. It's always temporary. And so we need to speak truth based on the eternal promises of Scripture. Earn some promises. Know them. Apply them to your heart. I know when I first started out in Christian ministry, I was a little bit scared. And I read in Matthew, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and he will add all these things unto you. Ah, there's a promise for me. If I seek God's kingdom in my life, he promises to supply what I need. And has he? Yes, he has. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That's a promise. He cares for you. Oh, Lord, I'm worried about this. Lord, I give it to you. It's a promise for you. Learn the promises of Scripture so you can speak truth in your own lives. So you can fix your hearts on what is unseen, what is permanent, because God has said it. God has decreed it as well. And the last thing we see, uh, the fourth thing we see is in verses 14 through 15. And I'll read the verses. Um, sorry, verses uh, yeah, 14, 15. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit. So the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Friends, to be changed, to become like Jesus, to be transformed in this present life, we need to live our lives in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. The hope of the resurrection is key 
to this. We don't just have a, a saviour who's a good example. We don't even just have a saviour who, who died on the cross to remove the impediment, the sin that gets between us and the life of God. But we have a saviour who rose from the dead and promises, and promises in the book of Philippians that we will have a body like unto his resurrected body. Ah. Oh. That is such enormous lives, news, such good news. We become believers. The life of God comes back into us in this vessel of clay by the Holy Spirit. We start to be changed to become like Jesus. And one day you'll leave this body, but you'll get a new one. The real you will be transformed and have a body which is like unto the resurrected body of Jesus. Now, if that is motivation to want to be like him now, I don't know what is. You can be like Jesus. Start on that journey so that when it actually finally completely happens, you know a little bit about what it's already about. So... Four things which will help us to become like Jesus. Can I make an application for us? Christian, do you want to change something in your life? Do you want to deal with something? A guilt, a fear, something of shame? And Jesus can help. Luke chapter 18 verse 1 says... You'll lose heart if you quit praying. Keep praying about those things. This passage we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 talks about this idea of proclaiming the message in chapter 3, proclaiming the message of the gospel. You know, when you start to tell others that Jesus has made a difference in your life, you won't lose heart. You'll start to be more like Jesus because that's why Jesus came, was to announce the way that people can be right with God. Christian, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Christian, you know, God loves you. He wants you to know everything about his love, to be filled with that. Be assured that you're loved by him. So many of us walk around thinking that nobody loves us, nobody cares. The truth is that God does. Jesus demonstrated it to you. He puts his life into you by his spirit so you can experience that in the here and now. Friend, maybe you're looking for more than life. Uh, last week, Tim made reference to this idea to his parents' generation. <laughs> I love the concept. His generation, he said, is looking for a cause and experiences to have meaning for life. My generation, from the baby boomers, looked for meaning in the West of Eastern religions and psychedelic music and out-of-body experiences. My parents' generation, I suspect, looked for meaning in life in service to humanity outside themselves and probably the Duke of Edinburgh exemplified that above a lot of people. Service for people. Three generations in our Western world who are looking for meaning in different ways. But friend, the ultimate meaning, the ultimate experience is by having Jesus in your life in the here and now. You'll serve, you'll have experiences, You'll find meaning and purpose. That's the ultimate, is Christ in you, the hope of glory, changing you, transforming you, so you'll be like him. Friend, if you don't know him in that way, can I invite you to get in touch? We'd love you to introduce him to you. 
We're humans. We know what life is about. But we also have found Jesus to be the answer so we can have meaning, purpose and change in our lives.